Praise our Lord Jesus. I'm going to do the opening scripture that the Lord led me to, and uh, then I'm going to pray. So Jesus gave us these words for today and for our lives. It's uh, John 13, 34, and 35. So I give you now a new commandment. Love each other as much as I have loved you. For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you're my true followers. So Lord, I just thank you for today, Lord God. I thank you for this blessing. I thank you for this church, for your people, Lord God, that I'm blessed to be counted as part of it, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you lead us to follow you, Lord God. That you give us your Holy Spirit and continue to pour into us and your people, Lord God. That in these times we do focus first and foremost on loving each other. Not just as a body of Christ, but as those that still need to come to know you. Pour your spirit out on on the rest of the word today, Lord God. Open up our our spirits and our hearts to to love you, Lord God, and, and receive what you have for each one of us today. In Jesus' holy name, amen. 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 Good morning, church. Um, I know Mick, Mick just uh, made an announcement, but there are worship lyrics available on the communion table if you haven't picked any up yet. And also, if you're watching on Facebook, on the Facebook page, there are links to the lyrics as well. So if you'll join me, uh, we're going to stand and we're just going to worship God this morning. Nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your living hope. Your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen of the sweetest. Shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what I.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen, amen. Let's give him a good praise. Let's, let's give him a good praise, y'all. Hey, Jesus. We got to make some noise for the Lord now. We can't, be, we can't be quiet and sophisticated and dignified all the time. I bet you don't be that way when you're mad at the hubby or wife. You be going there, hey, I told you. <laughs> no, I'm just messing with y'all. Praise God. Man, it's a beautiful day. Amen. Praise God that we're here. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you provide us another day. Another day to make sense of all that's going on going around in the world. You know, I, I, I go through day after day and I try to make sense of it spiritually. Some days I can, some days I can't. But you know what? I know that God has a plan. Amen. Amen. He has a plan for all of us. He has a plan for all the things that's happening. We just have to hang in there. I heard yesterday in the spirit, you gotta hang in there, brother. Yeah. You know, I know some things brings tears to our eyes. Some things, some things make us look at ourselves and check ourselves. And maybe that's what this whole thing is about. The corona, you know, uh, our financial issues, our spiritual issues. Maybe all that's about us checking ourselves, looking at selves and seeing where everything lines up at well i'm doing communion today and i'm you know i'm i'm always a little off to the <laughs> off to the left or off to the right i'm i'm never straight up and down in the middle because i just feel this in my spirit that say what the lord is giving you to say and communion it means to come together come together on one accord on spiritual issues that's one of the one of the definitions but the main spiritual issue that I want us that communion is all about is that our Lord Jesus who gave his life his blood he died for us and said do this in remembrance of me he said, remember me, remember me by taking the bread and by taking the cup. And, and, and I'm going to tell you something, man. When I do it on Sundays, I feel it. I feel it. I feel a revitalization coming on inside of me. I don't know. Everybody might, somebody might feel something else. But I look at that cup, man, because some Sundays I'm in here and I'm barely making it. <laughs> I'm so wore out from all the battles during the week. I'm barely making it. But man, after I get that bread in that cup, come on, y'all. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I know I ain't the only one came in here on a Sunday dragging and took the communion and the Lord, it seemed like it gave me new life. I came in here, I it maybe sinned or whatever, I don't even remember, but one Sunday I was so down. And I took out the bread, took out the wine, and the Lord said, I did that for you. This Remind you that I've forgiven your sins. That's what it's all about. We become one. We're on one accord with him when we take of his body and of his blood. 
We all know the scripture. I'm not even going to even go there this morning. But with all we've been through this year alone, not to mention the other, other times, man, we need to give him a shout. <laughs> because my God, Whoa, Jesus. Shorten that on my sock. Yo, Kondoro Moseye. We need to give him a shout, man. Man, man, this world is upside down and turned inside out. But Jesus. But Jesus. Come on, man. Lord God, we gonna Take of your body right now, Lord. Yeah. God, we thank you. thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for such a plan. Yeah. Your plan, man, your plan. I know every time, every time we take it, it's the enemy just get that much more mad. <laughs> he gets that. Hey, let's just laugh at the devil. He gets that much more mad every time because okay. this Sets us up for a whole nother week. God, I thank you. Jesus, you are the man. Let's take of his body, y'all. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. This is your body, Lord. We take of it now and we thank you for it, Lord Jesus. Lord. This is the wine. It represents your blood. And we become one today. We become one. Lord God, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of what we might have said or done or thought. God, forgive us this raggedy, nasty human body. That's what it, that's, that's all it represents. But our spirit. We represent you and we come one with you. Yeah. We drink of your blood, Lord yeah. God. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Father God. We just thank you for coming up with such a brilliant plan as communion, becoming one yeah. with you, sharing in your in your birth Glory. in your in your in your walk on earth Thank you, sharing in the miracles Thanks. and then you setting the rules and laying it down and whooping Satan's butt <laughs> you kick this butt Lord God and then, and then you went on the cross for us, for our sins. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, we continue in our journey in the Psalms. Again, I don't know about you, but I'm reading them and... The, the power of reading one psalm a day. We've actually been doing it. Uh, we've pretty much covered all the psalms once. So we've been doing this for uh, close to uh, five months. Where we really started it was with Psalm 89 on the 89th day of the year. We've been continuing to read a psalm a day and we're praying into those psalms and they've just been so powerful, directive, They've been prophetic. How many of you are recognizing you read something in the psalm for the day and it, it you experience it that day? Right. Amen. See, one of the things that's going on right now, one of the God's purposes behind all the chaos and pandemonium and disagreement the Lord's judging false prophecy right now. There's too much false prophecy yeah, in the yeah. earth. There's too much false prophecy in the church. People exalt their personal opinion and say, well, God showed me this. And I, I really 
you know, being a lifelong charismatic, I mean, I've been a charismatic for 50 years. I believe in prophecy, believe in the gifts of the Spirit, believe in the fivefold ministry of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. I've come to a place where almost when I hear somebody say, God said to me, I cringe. Yeah. I am just, it's just, God isn't saying everything that people are saying God is saying to them. There's so much confusion. And, and one of the places that we've really gotten away from is, see, when I read this book, I say, God said to me. Yeah. We have to get back to this book and the Word of God, particularly in the charismatic community. We've gotten so into experiences and feelings and opinions and and we've gotten away from God's word. It doesn't mean that God doesn't speak, but he speaks first and foremost through this word. And that's why I I wake up every day and say, I'm going to read Psalm 90 today. What is God going to speak to me? I'm going to read the Gospels today. What is God going to speak to me? I'm going to read Deuteronomy today. I'm going to read Revelation today. I'm going to read Romans today. What is God going to speak to me? So we know we're, we're on actually today is Psalm 93 for the second time around, day 243 of the year, which would be Psalm 1 through 93, second time around. We're in the Numbers book. Remember the significance. The Psalms are divided into five books. There's a Genesis book, Exodus book, Leviticus book, Numbers book, Deuteronomy book. And in, in, we just came out of the Levitical book. The Levitical book is about holiness. And we saw all the Psalms in, the, in book three, the Levitical book. There was this, this train of thought. There was this pattern. There was this thematic line drawn through book three of the Psalms about God's holiness, how God sets his people apart for his purposes. And now we're in the Numbers book. And, and remember, the Jews made that up, the five divisions of, of, of those books. And Numbers in Hebrew, the, the, what we call the book of Numbers is Bamidbar in Hebrew. The, the Jewish people call that book Bamidbar and it means in the wilderness. So we move from Genesis, which is the book of creation and origins, to Exodus, which is the book of God naming his people. These are the names, Shimos. That's the Hebrew title for Exodus. And it's about God setting his people free from their bondage. Leviticus is the holiness book. And we also said how God spoke. Vayikra is the Hebrew name for it. And God spoke to the people. And how God speaking to his people creates holiness in us. But now we're in the wilderness. And that started with Psalm 90 which was Thursday, and 91 was Friday, and 92 Saturday, 93 today. And the wilderness book runs from Psalm 90 through Psalm 106. And the whole point of the journey in the wilderness, who's leading the journey through the wilderness? Moses is leading the journey through the wilderness. So Psalm 90... What does Psalm 90 begin with? The superscription says, A prayer of Moses, the man of God. No individual is, is, is given a title of the next 11 Psalms, counting Psalm 90. And again, the, the Jews teach that Moses wrote all 11 of those Psalms. But Moses is clearly one of the key thematic figures in these psalms in the Bamidbar book, the wilderness book, because he's there at the start in Psalm 90, and we'll see he's there at the end in Psalm 106. And much of these psalms rehearses the history of Israel as Israel walked through the wilderness, their journey from 
Egypt into their inheritance. And we are walking through a wilderness now. And so, so, so we want to get this, this thematic emphasis in this book as we read. And it's going to be Moses. It starts off with the superscription. The title to Psalm 90 is A Prayer of Moses, the Man of God. This is Moses praying. And we're going to see the significance of Moses' prayer. What does he pray for God's people to understand as they begin to walk through the wilderness? Before we look at Psalm 90, let's go to the last Psalm of the Numbers book. That's Psalm 106. Go to Psalm 106. because we're going to see Moses at the start in the very first verse. And then there's all of this discussion uh, about Moses in Psalm 106, and we'll pick it up in verse 13. 106 is rehearsing the history of the children of Israel in the wilderness, and it's not very flattering. Verse 13 says, I'm reading from the ESV, but they, the, the children of Israel, I mean, all these great, powerful, mighty, wonderful things the Lord did through the wilderness. Verse 13 says, but they soon forgot his works. Forgot the works of the Lord. And see, the works of the Lord are going to be a key theme through all of these psalms. Establish your works, O oh God, your works. And then, then the... Uh, Moses in Psalm 90 says, establish your works. And then he says, establish the works of our hands. See, God has to establish his works so that our works now aren't our works anymore. They're his works. And so when we come into unity with God, when we come into solidarity with his purposes and his works, when his works become our works, then we can say, establish the works of our hands. So that's a key theme from Psalm 90 that begins the, the wilderness book of the Psalms. We get to the end, but they soon forgot his works. Verse 13, they did not wait for his counsel, but they had a wanton craving in the wilderness. The wilderness can draw us close to God, or the wilderness can get us in touch with our own cravings. We begin to be driven by our own cravings. When you hear prophecies about, oh, this is what's going on right now, ask yourself, is that prophecy consistent with establishing God's works or is it consistent with establishing my own desires, my own agenda, my own cravings? They had a wanton craving in the wilderness and put God to the test in the desert. See, when we're driven by our own desires, we put God to the test. We demand that God fulfills our desires. I mean, you know how it is in churches. Church isn't doing what I want. I'm going somewhere else. Emotional blackmail. Spiritual blackmail. We do the same thing with the Lord. Well, you know, you, you won't do it my way, then I'm going to sulk. Then I'm going to grumble. Then I'm going to murmur. Then I'm going to sin. We, we put God to the test. I mean, if we're doing it in our churches, we're doing it with God. We're doing it with our family members. They put God to the test in the desert. You know what the problem is of putting God to the test? If you don't do thus and so for me, Lord, well, I'll turn my back on you. I'll sulk. I'll get angry. I'll, I'll, I'll have a little time of backsliding. You know the problem is God gives us what we want when we demand it. We don't want what we want. We want what you want, Lord. Change my works into your works. He gave them what they asked, but sent the plague among them. I mean, I, I, I still, I say this and I offend people every time I say it, but I don't see in Scripture where the devil has the power to bring a worldwide pandemic. That's right. Devil, you think that 
devil has that kind of power? But God does. And the plague is always a sign in Scripture that God is giving his people their way. When men in the camp were jealous of Moses and Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord, and it goes back to Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and Korah. And remember, Korah and Dathan, that was about holiness. And the sons of Korah wrote psalms in the previous book because even though their father perished, they followed the Lord. Moses and Aaron are called the holy ones of the Lord, and it simply means they were set apart for God's purposes. The earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. Fire also broke out in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped a metal image. He ties together rebellion with idolatry. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God their Savior who had done great things in Egypt. Wondrous works in the land of Ham. Establish your works, Lord. And awesome deeds by the Red Sea. And then here's the reference to Moses at the end of the wilderness book. Therefore he said he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. The final reference to Moses in the wilderness book is Moses standing in intercession for the people. Back to Psalm 90. Psalm 90 begins a prayer of Moses, the man of God. The wilderness book is about this in the Psalms. Leaders pray for the people. That's how we stay the plague. That's how we make things right. That's how we bring healing. It's all about leaders interceding. In the first three books, of the Psalms, book one, book two, and book three, there's a lot of discussion about the sins of leaders. There's a lot of discussion about the sins of God's people. In this book, the wilderness book, there's no talk about the sins of the leaders. It's all about the sins of the people. What are leaders to do? They are to pray. They are to intercede. They are to stand in the gap for the land. They are to stand and make intercession. These next few weeks, leaders, intercessors, pray, pray, pray for the people of this church. Pray, pray, pray for our nation. Pray, pray, pray for other churches and other works. That's how you get through the wilderness through intercessory prayer intercessory prayer is a key apostolic strategy in this hour now I'm going to read a brief introduction to Psalm 90 we'll, let's, let's go back to Psalm 90 and look at this because it sets the tenor for the rest of the book I'm reading this from the commentary on the Psalms by Samson Raphael Hirsch. I don't just read Jewish commentaries, by the way, but most Christians don't read Jewish commentaries at all of Scripture. Read biblical Christian commentary. Jesus is our King and our Lord. But sometimes what the rabbis say about the Old Testament, it's like, How are we not seeing this? It's so obvious. Now, let me read a few verses before I read the comment from Hirsch. Psalm 90, verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, 
or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting you are God. Moses is going to show us how to intercede here. You start by acknowledging God as the Lord. God as King. Remember the last psalm of the previous book, Psalm 89. It's about the sure mercies that God gave to David. It's about the covenant God made with David. The, the fact that the, the kingship and the lineage of David is a very significant aspect to Jewish hopes, Old Testament hopes of a Messiah being fulfilled. The Messiah is going to come through the line of David. But Psalm 89 says we don't have a king anymore. Remember the other way to look at the five Psalms, we look at them as Torah books. The other way to look at the Psalms is that those five books are a rehearsal of the history of Israel. Book number one, the majority of the Psalms are Psalms of David. It talks about the kingship of David. That's where everything starts. The man after God's own heart. The second book, book two, is the kingship of Solomon. It ends with a psalm attributed to Solomon. And in Solomon, in, in the time of Solomon, the, the, the borders of Israel extended the closest that it ever would to the promises of God to Abraham. He said it's going to go from the sea to the river. The only time in Jewish history where they got close to that was under the reign of Solomon. Book three, which is what we just finished up last week, book three is about the divided kingdom. After Solomon, Rehoboam and Jeroboam split the kingdom into two nations, ten tribes of Israel in the north, two tribes that belonged to Judah and Benjamin in the south. The fourth book, is the book of exile. The division of God's people, the idolatry of God's people, the sin of God's people, they end up going into exile. And what happens in exile? There's no more kings. The final king of Judah was Zedekiah. He's there before Nebuchadnezzar takes the people away into Babylon and there would never again be a Jewish king after the line of David in Israel's history. So the 89th Psalm asks the question, but you made this covenant with David. Right at the end of the holiness book, the book of the divided kingdom, as the fourth book, it's the book of the wilderness, but it's the book of exile. It's when Israel goes into exile and they have no king. And so the theodicy, the confusion that's in Psalm 89 is, will God be faithful to his promises? We're looking around and saying, what the heck is going on here? The Lord spoke. There would always be a descendant of David on the throne, and that descendant, that king, embodied the hope of all the people that Messiah would come. When you read Jewish commentaries now of the Old Testament, they're still waiting for the Messiah to come. And they're waiting for, Orthodox Jews are still waiting for the reestablishment of a Jewish king so Messiah can come. Well, we understand the Lord did the old switcheroo on that. God's purposes are not always fulfilled the way we think. So here we are. We're, we're in Psalm 89, no more kings, and the people are saying, God, where are you? Are you going to fulfill your promises? And when you go through dark times in the Lord, when you go through exile, when you're journeying through the wilderness, we are asking the same question. Are your promises going to be fulfilled? Shoot, people don't even have to go through what we're going through now. Things don't happen in their lives. With a marriage, with a child, with a ministry, with a dream, with a family member, with a relationship, with a job. And we're questioning, where are you, God? So why does Moses pray? 
in Psalm 90 because it's an answer to the prayer, the cry of Psalm 89. Where are you, Lord? Oh, I, I'm still here. And I need my leaders to rise up and make intercession so my people see that I'm still here. And the interesting thing, it's a return to a time before the kingship when all Israel had, when they were coming out of the wilderness, they only had one king. The Lord was the king. It's not about a human king. It's not about a human answer. It's not about a human leader. It's not about who wins the presidency. It's not about it. Neither of those candidates are going to save me and neither of those candidates are going to ruin me because God is king. Amen. Because the Lord is king. Hallelujah. Because Jesus is king. So Moses, it's a time of returning to where the Lord and the Lord alone is king. Remember, the kingship starts in 1 Samuel. The historical book before 1 Samuel is Judges. Before there was a king, before Saul and David begin this whole idea of kingship in Israel, the rulers of Israel were called judges. Now a judge is shapat in Hebrew. Shapat is what kings and judges do. It's they reign. And shapat is related to the word mishpat. Mishpat is justice. So judges and kings are supposed to rule and reign according to justice. But before you have a king, you have judges. And it says in 1 Samuel 7, Samuel judged Israel. Samuel's a judge. He's called a judge up to Samuel chapter 7. But when he anoints the king, Samuel is called a prophet. There's this, this transitioning from the rule of judges. And a judge is kind of a hybrid. Okay, it's it's face-to-face -face and online. The, 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 the judge is a hybrid prophet king. He's not quite a king. He's not quite a prophet. He's both. But he exercises authority. The final statement of the book of Judges is this. And this this, this is what led to the mistaken solution of God's people. You know, the reason that Israel has kings is because they were mistaken. They said, we have no order. We need a king. We need a president of law and order, right? No, we don't. We need God to be king. Praise God if he's for law and order. Praise God even more if he's for justice but we need God to be king. And so the final verses of Judges says this, there was no king in Israel and every man did right according to what was right in his own eyes. See, see the problem when, when, when there's not true biblical authority established and true biblical authority is God is king. Jesus is king of kings and Lord of lords. That's true biblical authority is when we don't follow the Word of God, and when we don't follow the words of those who are just pointing you to the Word of God, not their own opinion, we, we make decisions on what's right and wrong based on our own understanding, what suits us. Now the mistake was, we, we, we don't have order, so let's get a king. Remember what the Lord said to Samuel when he installed the first king, Saul. Samuel's arguing with him. We don't need a king. And the Lord says, yeah, they want a human king because they're rejecting me as king. But let's go ahead and do it. There's a lesson to be learned here. So Moses starts off and he's praying. When there's no king in Israel, again, in the exile... The Lord becomes the king once again. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, 
or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And then as he starts out with prayer by praising the Lord, and then the second portion of his prayer, he looks at God's people. You return man to dust. The Hebrew says something like, you pulverize human beings. You return man to dust and say, Return, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it's past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. And there's this remembrance, the second part of a leader interceding for God's people. We look at God and see who he really is, and we look at people and see who they really are. It's not up to us to condemn human beings. You know, bringing people under condemnation as a way to get people to be righteous always fails. Because human beings do what human beings do. We see who God is, we see who human beings are. Trust me, there's enough anger from the Lord. It does not need to be multiplied by human anger. The anger of man does not, excuse me, the anger of man does not work out the righteousness of God. So here's what Hirsch says about this. Notice that a thousand years are as a day, and a day is like a thousand years. Keep that in mind. Hirsch says Psalm 90, the first chapter of Book 4, is closely linked with the preceding psalm, which was the final chapter of Book 3. I've already talked about the relationship between 89 and 90. More than 2,000 years of the history of mankind has gone by. By the time Moses gets there, if you follow the old Christian and the old Jewish dating, uh, beginning with Adam being in 4000 BC, you got 2,000 some years. And 2,000 years after the creation of Adam, according to the Old Testament numbers, that's when Abraham is chosen by God. So this is the 2,000 years that Hirsch believes are being referred to in the prayer of Moses. More than 2,000 years of the history of mankind has gone by. The world had lapsed once more in the spiritual and moral chaos. According to our teachers, the choosing of Abraham, the election of Abraham, marked the end of the 2,000 years of chaos in man's history and the beginning of a new era of 2,000 years in which the law of God was to find a permanent place to begin with in the midst of one nation that had been entrusted with the mission to advance the moral and spiritual birth, rebirth, he says, of mankind. He had said earlier, he said, like Psalm 89, Psalm 90 has as its central theme the thought that man will descend into utter non-existence if it were not for his rebirth which can be expected to come to pass if God's people fulfill their mission. That's very biblical. Jesus came and he created. He gave rebirth. He created a spiritual creation. It was a rebirth, a new creation. Jesus came and God's people, 2,000 years after Jesus, what is our job? To live for rebirth. When we are praying, God, you are awesome, people of God, human beings, you're nothing. Send rebirth, Lord. Send rebirth. We should be praying as the leaders of God's people now for a rebirth. And he says this, he closes this, but it was only with the assignment of the mission to Moses that the beginning of this new era actually became evident. Now I want you to understand something about Moses. When you think of Moses, you think of an 
image of an Old Testament prophet. He's called a prophet. He's called the greatest of prophets. But I don't think that's really what the Old Testament is suggesting. Ephesians 2.20 says, the church is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. And I used to teach it. Most people teach that New Testament apostles, New Testament prophets are the foundation of the church. I'd like to suggest it's New Testament apostles, Old Testament prophets. The Old Testament prophet has more in common with the New Testament apostle than just Old Testament prophet, New Testament prophet. Old Testament prophets saw the Lord. The Lord appeared to them. Whether it's Moses on Mount Sinai or Isaiah in the temple. Or yeah, I don't I don't this this thing is just yeah, drifting away. <laughs> it's drifting away. We we will t we we we'll, we'll I'll just hang on for dear life here as I as I finish up. Moses comes and there's a change. Ezekiel saw the Lord when the heavens open. Jeremiah speaks with the word of the Lord. How do you speak with a word if a word is just a message or a spoken thing or something written on a on a sheet of paper? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for technical st strategies and wisdom. It's it's working. I I, I think we. I, by God, I think it's working. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Moses is an apostle. He's seen the Lord, yeah. and see, an apostle is raised up to lead God's people back into His kingship, and the apostle does it first and foremost by interceding for God's people. We don't have time to look at it now because we're running out of time, but if you go to Exodus 32 and Exodus 33, the Lord says, Moses, you're up on the mountain getting the law from me and the people are making a calf. I want to destroy them. The anger of Yahweh rages against God's people. I, I, I delivered them out of Egypt and, and, and a, a little over a month later, 50 days later, they're worshiping gods of Egypt. Destroy them and I'll start over with you. And the man of God says, don't do it, Lord. Don't destroy your people, Lord. Their dust, you could pulverize them, Lord. Their days are like grass that withers in the field. Don't do it, Lord. Raise them up and bring them into the land. And you see, that's what Psalm 90 is about. If we're going to go through the wilderness saying, yeah, Lord, go, go, go ahead and destroy these people. They drive me crazy. I, I often said that. I said, I'm glad I didn't have the choice at Mount Sinai because I'd say, good idea, Lord. <laughs> these people drive me crazy. Just let me, I just want my wife my dog and my books, other than that, go for it, Lord. <laughs> but Moses stands. And see, Moses is seen as the only person in the Old Covenant Scriptures who got God to change his mind. Do you want to understand? Leaders, intercessors, get God to change his mind right now. Coronavirus, potential civil war, complete economic disruption. Change your mind, Lord. So the third part of Moses' prayer, verse 7, For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. 
we bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and the wrath that brings your fear to us? And he concludes the third part of the prayer. So part one, we extol God. Part two, we remind God we're nothing before him and without him. He is our dwelling place. We're not his dwelling place. And it ends with a powerful verse, and this may be the entire theme of the Numbers book. It may be summed up. So teach us to number our days that we may obtain a heart of wisdom. What does it mean to number our days? Does it mean to, oh, he said 70 or 80 years. Let's see, Jan, I'm, I'm 69. Maybe I'll make it to 80. Let me multiply 11 times 365, and I'll just do an X each day. Okay, now I have this many days. That's not what it means. The Hebrew of number our days means summarize the purpose of our lives. We need to look back and say, why has God put me here? What is God's purpose? What is the reason the Lord is angry? How can we fulfill his purposes? It means to summarize the purpose of your days. And then a second application, since it's part of the prayer for God's anger, it's also discern what's going to get us out of God's anger and how long we might have to endure that anger. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. And then we come to the fourth. And the fourth part says, Relent, O Lord. Yes. Relent. That's the exact words that Moses asked yes. the Lord when he came down from Mount Sinai. He said, I'm going to wipe them all out. And start, Relent, Lord. Yes. Stop. Reevaluate, Lord. And then most of your translations say something like, have pity on your servants. It is a Hebrew word that means to have compassion, but when it's in the particular grammatical structure it is in this, it means change your mind because of your compassion. Relent, O Lord, how long? Change your mind and have pity on your servants. So the fourth part is getting God to change his mind. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Your steadfast love, your covenant love, your faithful love, your loyal love, your loyal to your purposes, your loyal to your people. He's reminding the Lord, you yourself, Lord, you've given us all kinds of reasons why you will change your mind and we want you to change your mind. Change your mind in America right now, Lord. Change your mind in the earth right now, Lord. Change your mind at law, Lord of the harvest. Change your mind, Lord. Satisfy us in the morning. We're walking through the evening of the wilderness, aren't we? Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. See, that's what people are saying. Well, this is heavy what we're going through now, but there's, there's coming a revival on the other side of it. That's, that's the prayer of Moses. Let's pray for that revival. Lord, for as much affliction as we are now experiencing, give us, Lord. Give us gladness. And for as many years as we have seen evil, and then he says what I was saying, let your work be revealed to your servants. See, this is the heart of wisdom. Give us a heart of wisdom. Cause us to number our days. And the heart of wisdom is let your work be shown to your servants. 
We move from being his people to being his servants in the wilderness. That's what we, you know, we move from being consumer Christians. God is just another source of meeting my needs. Yeah. We move from being his people to being his servants when his works are revealed. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. I want my children, my children's children, and my children's children's children to see his glorious power. Let the favor of the Lord, our God, be upon us. Let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. It's the same word. Let the beauty of the Lord, our God, be upon us. It's used in Psalm 27. says, One thing have I desired. This shall I do. To stand and see the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. The beauty of the Lord. To see the beauty of the Lord is the same Hebrew word here. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands because now your work will be our work. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And I got three minutes to summarize the remaining psalms, but... What's the next psalm? Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. No plague will come near your dwelling. The Lord will hide you under the pinions of his wings. He'll, he'll set his love upon us. See, from Psalm 90 to Psalm 91, there's a big change in the heart of God, isn't there? See, that's what we're doing. In the wilderness, we're praying as the leaders of God's people. We're praying for God to move from his wrath and anger of Psalm 90 into his sovereign protection against all our enemies in Psalm 92, or Psalm 91. Psalm 92 is a song for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is God's rest. In the Sabbath, we rest in his what? Kingship. And then do you know what the remainder of the Psalms in the book do? Look at Psalm 93 for today. It starts out with the kingship of the Lord. So as we pray, as we see we ch God changes his heart and he begins to defeat our enemies, we enter into his Sabbath rest. The Sabbath is not a time, oh, how dare you work on the Sabbath. It's a time we don't need to work because we're too busy celebrating the Lord. And 93.1 says that's the pattern to enter into God establishing his kingship. The Lord reigns, Psalm 93, 1 says. He is robed in majesty. Psalm 94. O Lord, God of vengeance, O God of vengeance, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth. The king exercises his judgment, and it's a psalm all about justice. And then we get into Psalm 95 and as we move through the wilderness and we see God's kingship established we enter into worship come let us sing to the Lord Psalm 95 says let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation let us come into his presence with thanksgiving let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise why for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all the gods. When his kingship is established, we celebrate, we worship. Justice is manifested. The next psalm is all about holiness. Holiness is released when we have God's kingship. Psalm 97. More about the kingship of the Lord. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Psalm 98. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. It's about the Lord reigning. And we get to Psalm 100. And Psalm 100 has a title. A psalm for giving thanks. It's pure worship and thanksgiving. Rejoicing, So we move from the anger of God in Psalm 90 to pure rejoicing. And then, of course, the last few psalms leading up to Psalm 106, which brings us back again to 
Moses praying and interceding for God's people, there's this re rehashing of Israel's former history where they rebelled against God. And the close of this book is, don't do that. Do this. The first part of the book, do this. Second part of the fourth book, don't do that. Don't remember what they did and don't go there. Do this. And when the kingship of the Lord is established, we end in the place of ultimate worship. So, leaders and intercessors. As we're going through these psalms, we're, we're in our journey through the wilderness. Pray, intercede for God's people. Use Psalm 90 as a pattern. We cry out to God, relent. Change your mind about your people because of your great compassion. Do it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Alex Ribeiro is going to close us out in prayer. Brother Alex, come on forth. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus Christ, just praising you, Lord God, for another day with, with our spiritual family, Lord God. We just pray that you remind us, Lord God, that this word that was seated in our hearts, that it take root, Heavenly Father, that you remind us not to forget your works, not to forget your goodness, not to forget who you are, Lord God. That you remind us, Lord God, of, uh, of the mistakes that your people have made in the past to fall into idolatry, Lord God, and to, and to forget your works, Heavenly Father. Let us instead intercede, Lord God, that there will be a new birth, Lord God, that we will rejoice in you, Lord God, always remembering who you are, always remembering your mercy, Lord God, your holiness, your perfection, Lord God, and your love toward us, Heavenly Father. Change our hearts, Lord God, and help us to establish your purposes here on earth, Lord God, by your strength, Lord God. Help us to seek your glory as we sung earlier, Lord God. Help us to be aware of your presence, Lord God, and to be aware of your purposes for our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.